Okay, everyone, uh, welcome to this session. Is there a case for fossil fuels? Um, we're going to get started on time uh, because we only have 45 minutes for this burning question. Thank you, thank you. My name's Tony Gilland, and I'm a teacher of maths and economics. And in a former era, I was the science and society director at the Institute of Ideas. So I'm really delighted to be invited back to chair this session. I've been told we've got to be fast-paced, so little introduction. We all know what this debate is about. Here in the UK, Don, uh, we've got this massive question of rising gas prices, uh, and we also have a government determined to bring in, bring in uh, uh, electric-only vehicles, completely decarbonised electricity by 2035, uh, and getting rid of boilers in our homes to be replaced by uh, some... Uh, thermal heating system, which I don't yet have my head round, okay? <laughs> so it's a big, big question here in the UK. Uh, obviously, there's a wider international perspective, and the UK is hosting COP26, the climate conference in Glasgow, in about a month's time. So our speakers, first to speak uh, uh, is Don Watkins. He's the best-selling author of Free Market Revolution and Equal is Unfair. And he's also about to publish his first novel. So we're very pleased to have Don with us. Uh, Don also previously, uh, if I think I'm correct, worked at the Ayn Rand Institute. Uh, and the Ayn Rand Institute is partnering with us today, along with the Ayn Rand Centre. So a big thank you uh, to those two organisations. Then, to offer a slightly different perspective, we'll see, uh, we have Dr. Caster Hewitt, who is a lecturer in uh, the Water Group uh, and Programme Director of Euro Aqua. But at the University of Newcastle, mm. but particularly interesting to me, he is the director of The Great Debate. And The Great Debate is a community organisation that has maintained a space for public debate in the North East since 1998. So completely in the spirit of the Battle of Ideas. So welcome to you both. A quick round of applause for them. <laughs> so on this key question, Don, your thoughts, please. Sure. So my background and major interest is in philosophy. And the reason I became interested in philosophy is because I think it is the key to human flourishing. It gives us a framework for how to think and how to live so that we can all have the best lives possible. And I think a crucial thing if you're interested in human flourishing is this question, which is in 1800, something really spectacular happened, which is that suddenly the average person was living better and better than any time in history. Every metric of human progress from uh, life expectancy to population to income was rising dramatically. And I think part of the answer of what happened is that we were able for the first time in history to use energy in order to power machines to do our work for us. And this is so vital to our ability to function. Indeed, I think one an easy and often tragic way to see that is what happens when we don't have energy. When you have a blackout, you have even temporarily an experience of like life grounds to a halt and it gets much worse. And then part of what we have to remember is that, you know, there's a billion people who live like that all the time. Um, there are slightly less than a billion people who don't have access to any electricity and mil billions more who are struggling to get anywhere near our standard of living because they can't have machines and don't have machines to do their work for them. And so it was that recognition that energy is fundamental to human flourishing that was part of the reason I became interested in energy. And then it was the recognition that I think the way that we think and talk about energy is not very helpful. I think it's, does not, it undermines our ability to make wise decisions about energy. And in particular, I think about it this way. So I'm much more interested today in persuading you of a better way of thinking about energy than I am about my conclusions. I'm not really going to try to persuade you that I think we should use fossil fuels more. I'm going to explain what persuaded me. And the basic issue is this, that if you were going to make a decision about energy, you'd want to do, I think, get on the table, what are our options, and then look at the positives and side effects, the positives and negatives of all of those alternatives and then decide, all right, what is best going to promote human well-being? And I don't think that's what we do. I think that in most discussions that I encountered about energy, we only heard negatives about fossil fuels, and we only ever heard positives 
about favored alternatives, particularly solar and wind. And even if you come to conclude that fossil fuels are a net negative for humanity and that they can be replaced, I think we can all agree that that kind of biased thinking is unproductive and can't lead us to making good decisions. And so then the question is, all right, well, what are the positives and what are the negatives, the alternatives? And we don't have a ton of time, so I just want to give you a couple big picture things that made a big impact on my thinking. So in terms of the positives, I think we have to really take seriously that 80% of the time when humanity uses fossil or uses energy, they choose fossil fuels. And they're not choosing them because like it's the politically popular thing to do. They're choosing them because for most people in most situations and most use cases, fossil fuels provide the lowest cost, most reliable form of energy to meet our goals. And then the alternatives of solar and wind, the the fact is that why haven't they been able to take off? And it, there's a fundamental problem that they face, and everybody understands this problem, which is that because they're intermittent, you, they can't provide reliable energy. They need backup. And because they can go close to zero at any given time, they need close to 100% backup. And so if you look at the places that use solar and wind the most, they have the highest energy costs because intermittent forms of energy can't replace a reliable infrastructure. They can only add to the infrastructure. So then, so I think that on the uh, ability of fossil fuels to provide reliable low cost energy, they're clearly superior right now. We can talk about going into the future what that holds, but I do want to say a word about climate because the, if you have something that has all these benefits but it's swamped out by a catastrophic risk, well then those benefits don't matter. So we have to take seriously concerns about climate. I think there's no question that CO2 has a warming influence, but what's as important as something's impact on the climate is our ability to cope with climate. And using energy and technology, we've been able to reduce climate-related deaths by 98% over the last century. And the question is, will that hold going forward? And the point that I would argue is that the burden of proof is very high on people who say, no, climate is going to get so bad so quickly that it's going to overwhelm our amazing ability to adapt and to use technology and energy in order to protect ourselves from what is always a dangerous climate. So those are the core ingredients of how I think about these questions. Thank you, John. <laughs> okay, a great framework to get us started. Casper, please. Yeah, um, yeah, thanks, Don. Um, I agree with everything you said. So, so in that in that sense, we we haven't got a, a point of debate. But I'm sure there'd be lots of stuff from the audience. Um, I, I was looking at the question though: the, Is there a case for fossil fuels? Well, yes, basically. I mean, I, I think I should stop there because there there clearly is. Um, <laughs> I, th I think we, you know, we need to ask some fundamental questions. This really follows on from what Don was talking about, really about what sort of society we want, what sort of future we want, what do we want for our children, our grandchildren, as well as, well as for us. You know, do we want international travel? I do, but you know, do, do you? Do we actually want these things? Do we want oranges and bananas? You know, to, to have on our shelves at home in our in our kitchens. Um, do we want to level up? I thought, I've got to throw that one in. Uh, um, and I'm, I'm not talking about uh, Boris, really. I'm talking about on, on the world stage. You know, I actually think, you actually look at the poverty in the world, you look, you look at the level of development across the world, and actually I would like to see a level of de development something like ours for everybody. Um, none of these things are going to be possible if we just get rid of fossil fuels, you know, it's, uh, it's not just about the present, it's about the future, it's about what sort of world we want for people. Um, also, it depends where you're sitting. I mean, you know, if you're sitting in the UK, which we are, which is obviously one of the wealthiest nations in the world, we have this fantastic infrastructure and so on, the sort of the move away from fossil fuels, not in its entirety, but to move away from it to an extent is a possibility, you know, with wind power, with solar power and so on. If you're sitting in India and you're actually trying to develop, um, you're absolutely reliant on coal. You know, they, they, they are not going to be able to move forwards unless they continue to, to use coal um, in, in the way that they are today. So. It has a different context depending where in the world you're sitting and, and, and you know, what you want to, want to achieve and what you want for people. 
Um, so that, that's a sort of the general framework. I thought just, just a few technical things, uh, and again, it, it relates to some of the things um, Don alluded to. Um, you actually look at different types of fuels, and I just thought I'd just throw a few, a few small figure, figures out. If you actually look, obviously, before 1800, um, when you were talking about the human flourishing that started, um, people relied on wood primarily, now, coal is three times more efficient than wood. You get the, for the same weight, you, you get a, about three times as much energy out of coal. If you then go to oil, you're doubling again. If you go to gas, you're adding another sixth or something on. So in terms of what you can get per weight, um, this, is, this is really relevant and really important, especially when you're thinking about things like travel. This is why I mentioned international travel. If you look at a lithium battery, if you actually want to get the same um, energy out of a lithium battery, you need 90 times the weight. Now, if you want to put an aeroplane in the sky, <laughs> this is actually a different ball game from maybe a lightweight car. It might be possible to, to drive a car by a battery. It's never going to be possible to drive a, a, a big aeroplane. So th these are some of the things I wanted to think about, really. Um, just a couple of things then, because I haven't run out of time, amazingly, <laughs> uh, was uh, just thinking about some, some of the way these... these, these <laughs> Does that mean I'm on yellow? <laughs> uh, OK. Um, the, um, some of the things that just make me really cross, and, and in fact, I was talking about this to, to someone earlier, you know, uh, recently in the northeast, um, sorry, not northeast, but in Cumbria, there have been plans to build uh, a new mine there. It's actually, it's for steel production, the, the coal that was going to be produced. Um, and I mean, it's, this has been going on for years, um, you know, to and fro, to and fro. We actually thought it was going to be built. I now think it probably isn't going to be built. Um, and you actually look at this, it's really hold, you know, it just holds back progress. The, these, these, these sorts of um, attacks on on, on new developments, and it's, it's unreasonable, and yeah, we, we need to fight against it. I'll stop there. Okay, thank you very much, Gaspar. <laughs> okay, so both our speakers have been uh, positive about fossil fuels. Uh, Don's offered us a framework for thinking about these things. I just want to put a question to you both before going out to the audience, uh, to kind of perhaps try and put you under a little bit of pressure here. Um, when I researched into this issue some time ago, it was very fascinating that scientists in the 1950s didn't think that carbon dioxide would cause a problem. They basically thought that the excess carbon dioxide would sink into the ocean. And when they started to say, well, hang on a minute, what if that's not happening, and started to measure it, and discovered that it wasn't sinking into the ocean, it was going out into the atmosphere, at that point in time, there was about 20,000 terawatt hours of fossil fuels consumed a year globally. Cut to today, and it's in excess of, it's more than six times that amount. So the developing countries that you've rightly pointed out, there has been an explosion in fossil fuel use. Mm -hmm. The science that we're told about, or the scientists say, that we need to keep temperature increases to within 1.5 degrees of pre-industrial levels. And this can only happen if we hit net zero by 2050. That's what we hear all the time. That is what the British government is organising around and many other Western governments. Do you dismiss that? I definitely don't dismiss it because, look, we have to rely on experts in order to make decisions. And I think there's two ways that you can go wrong with that. One is that you just dismiss all experts and like, no, I'm gonna figure out everything myself. Well, good luck with that. Um, or it's that you passively accept them. And in this case, there's a big difference between an expert who, let's say, is a climate scientist saying, these will be the impacts of th that we assume will happen under certain levels of CO2, and an expert saying, this is the solution. And I don't think a climate scientist is in a position to say, this is, um, the solution that one must embrace if you buy into the science because what they are not taking into account of is the full big picture of the cost and the benefits of restricting our best form of energy. So at most what they can tell us is we think that the consequences of warming in excess of so many degrees 
will have these impacts, but then it's a question where you have to be able to look wider at issues in energy and economics to see um, what are the best policies that follow from that estimate of what would happen to the climate. So there's more to say about that, but it's you, you have to um, evaluate what the experts say active-mindedly, and what they need to do is help us understand the kind of causal picture, not just say, here's policies that you need to blindly embrace. Okay, but then you need to evaluate what the scientific experts are telling you, but if you are not yourself an expert, on what basis are you evaluating it? So it, it should be easier than it is because in every society you have a knowledge system that takes things from the kind of discovery level all the way to journalism to the man in the street who kind of takes things in. And unfortunately, our knowledge system is very broken. And you see this, I think, in, in climate and more than any other issue, which is if you actually look at the scientists, the papers that the IPCC initially produces, um, they say one thing. Then that gets channeled into a report for policymakers that makes much more bold predictions about where the future is mm -hmm. headed. Then those get reported in the press with these kind of crazed announcements of the world's going to end in a decade. And so what I, the main thing that I would recommend is look for experts who are giving the big picture and who are not exaggerating in the way that um, we often see. And unfortunately, you have to do a little bit more of the heavy lifting today. Uh, you can't rely on the media. You want to actually go to the original works by the experts and um, seek out explanations. But it takes a lot of work, and that's why a lot of what uh, I've done in my work with the Center for Industrial Progress and Alex Epstein is we specialize in talking to those experts and trying to make it understandable to a layman what they're actually saying. Can so I trust the experts that are expert at questioning the experts? That was a, sorry, that was a, a slightly, uh, uh, that was a bit of a joke, but I'll let you come back in a bit. Yeah. Casper, your take on this. Yeah, um, I mean, net zero is a load of uh, rubbish. <laughs> yes. I mean, the, uh, I, I, you know, I mean, it, you're right, we, we do need to look at the science, and I think, you know, a lot of evidence is good. There's a lot of uncertainty, that's fine. All, all models, there's always uncertainty, that's fine. But the reality is that if we actually are interested in climate change, and if we're actually interested in, in keeping temperatures to certain levels, net zero has got nothing to do with anything because it's not going to do it. Um, you know, the levels of CO2 in the atmosphere um, would mean continued warming for another 150 years or 200 years, or whatever, you know, accord, according to the science. So if we stopped emitting now, the temperature will keep going up for a couple of hundred years. What, if you actually want, want to try and solve that, you actually need to try and intervene. I, mean, I, I, I like the idea of geoengineering, but actually no one is willing to do it. There's this idea of human hubris. There's this idea, no, we shouldn't act. We shouldn't act on the climate. We're acting on the climate anyway. We're actually, call, you know, if, if the model's right, we're causing the climate to, to, to change and the temperatures to go up. So why shouldn't we intentionally act to, to counteract that? It does, doesn't make any sense to me that, that, we're, that there is actually opposition to this. I had a room, just talking about debates, you know, you get 500 geoscientists in a room in, in, in Europe having a debate on this specifically, and I could not get one person to put their hand up and say that they were in favour of geoengineering, even though there are known technologies that we could do, and we could do full-scale experiments today at the cost of a couple of million quid. Just very briefly, give us an example of what you mean by geoengineering. Um, well, one, a nice example is, 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 is a really nice, simple one, which is actually putting ships out to sea that spray seawater into the atmosphere which causes cloud cover, which has, has a cooling effect. Um, so you, um, not only does it have, have the advantage that you can turn this on and switch it off, you could do a full-scale experiment, and if it doesn't look like it's working or if it looks like there's some sort of problem with it, you, you stop doing it and, and the effect's gone in a few hours. So there's absolutely no reason to not do really big-scale, full-scale experiments the, the science behind this has been known for 20 years. You know, people have actually done all the modelling. You actually need to do it, but nobody will do it. That, that's the point I'm making about there, there isn't a willingness to do it. Okay. 
Yeah, let me just point say one quick thing yeah. about that, which is that um, there's kind of an un underlying assumption in the way that we're taught to think about our relationship to the environment and to climate that I think explains exactly what you're talking about, which is if you really thought that we're headed for this overwhelming catastrophe that we're unable to cope with, then those are exactly the kinds of solutions you would be very interested in pursuing. But there's a fundamental assumption about the nature of human beings that's built into it, which is that, in effect, absent human intervention, nature is this kind of nurturing thing that takes care sure. of us, and that whenever we act upon nature, it, our impact is inherently negative and self-destructive and destructive of mm -hmm. the planet. Mm -hmm. And if you have that bias, then no, you're not going to engage in exactly those kinds of practices. But instead, I think we can intelligently impact nature. And indeed, I think the whole record of fossil fuels is one of intelligent impact, uh, increasingly intelligent impact. And I think if you were concerned with um, uh, climate, then it's exactly those kinds of intelligent impacts that we would be striving to research and look for. But we don't because of that bias. Mm. OK, so I'm going to go out to the audience and just just a thought for the two speakers as well, though. On Don's perspective there, uh, you would say there's a pessimism out there that's then read, you know, people then read into the science a very pessimistic outlook about human impact. Mm -hmm. Others might say, you've got a laissez-faire attitude. Uh, basically, you're being complacent. It leads you to a sort of rose-tinted view of what the science is telling us. Just a thought that the different cultural narratives can play both ways in this debate. So just a thought for you. Right. Yeah, I just wanted to say that uh, quite often when this uh, discussion happens around fossil fuels, people are just thinking about electricity production or how you power a car. But I, but I think it's much, much bigger than that. If you look around the room now, I know this building was built several hundred years ago, but imagine if it's slightly more modern. Every single thing in this room, everything is produced through fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. So the plastic, the, in fact, this is acrylic. This is made out of, literally made out of fossil fuels. All the clothes we're wearing uh, were harvested through fossil fuels, processed through fossil fuels, transported through fossil fuels, refrigeration is fossil fuels. All the containers going, uh, taking things from China is fossil fuels. Everything, absolutely everything, is entirely dependent on fossil fuels. And, and yet the question is all narrowed down to sort of energy production or, you know, whether we should have batteries in cars. That's, a, that's actually only a little, little part of it. Yeah. And so I think it's an utter fantasy to think that we can live without fossil fuels. And the fantasy gets even more mad. So we've got a situation, if we just look at energy, where Boris Johnson a couple of weeks ago was off persuading Joe Biden to try and do, his, uh, do, do a little trick for him at the COP26 so he looks like the big boy. And, and, you know, he can keep carry happy with his, with his green credentials. At a time where there's literally a fuel crisis and a gas crisis, mm -hmm. and we've got £60 billion worth of gas half a mile under our, under our feet. I mean, it's just, it, these people are in utter fantasy land. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> applause is fine. Um, very keen for people with critical views of our panel to speak. Just because they've given a particular perspective mm -hmm. doesn't mean that you can't give a different one. Yeah, go ahead, please. Yeah, thanks, Tony. Yeah, just a brief point, really. It seems to me one of the problems uh, with this whole discussion in terms of the way people see it is they see uh, carbon and climate as in a zero-sum game. And they see things from the perspective very much of the present without any conception of how things could be uh, in the future. I mean, I think the case that we have to make is to take people's concerns about uh, climate change very, very seriously, but actually make the point that it's through the exploiting of fossil fuels that we can create the wealth, that we can invest in the R&D and invest in probably nuclear power would be the thing mm -hmm. I'd, I'd flag up. I absolutely reject the idea that whether we reach net zero or whatever we're going for in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, I mean, in geological time, this is like less than a drop in the ocean. And I really do think we should promote the idea that we need to exploit resources to create wealth, to make, I mean, this is what we've always done from canals through steam and everything else. Uh, I would disagree that, um, I think, who was it said it, flying? I think we possibly will have batteries, battery-powered aircraft. I mean, there are prototypes oh, for maybe. lightweight aircraft now. It might be two or three technologies down the line, mm -hmm. but let's not rule anything out. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm from Bangladesh, and uh, it's really, uh, for me, it's hard to accept the fact that we are sitting here and talking about exploiting more fossil fuels. Because I'm from the southwest coastal part of Bangladesh, and my community is sinking. And it's probably these lavish ones that makes us push towards 
extracting more fossil fuels. I know we are not going to reach net zero by 2050. I know it's a fantasy idea, but if we keep thinking about such ideas, then we'll never be able to go for renewables, we'll never be able to go for batteries or more non-extractive economy. And uh, the idea of geoengineering, you talked about it. So most of the ideas are not proven that whether it's successful or not. Spraying seawater in probably England's coast would damage uh, the tropical areas of Amazon or something like that. So anything that's not concrete, because we have science now on our side. When we extracted coal, we didn't have science. When we extracted fossil fuels, we didn't have science. But now we have science. So even if we are not sure about anything in particular, we shouldn't go and ex keep on extracting or try out new geoengineering things. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'm honestly so disappointed so far, especially in terms of like no nobody's living in a, in a fantasy world. Nobody is thinking of fossil fuels in a totally negative light. No one is denying that fossil fuels weren't a positive thing. Obviously, they, they changed the world and they built our cities and, and everything. But, you know, so was sugar. Sugar was completely positive. When the Western world first started refining sugar, it was huge. We were sending it off to soldiers. It was giving them instant energy. It was literally saving lives. Now it's so toxic and it's giving us all of these health problems, like a myriad of them. It's the same thing with CO2. Like, nobody is saying that, oh my God, how terrible we were to dig up fossil fuels and, and we should never do it again. No one is saying that. It, it was are, a really, actually. really positive thing. But honestly, isn't it better to think about a better future? Like, I'm already angry at my parents' generation for not fighting against something that needs to be bad. I don't want my kids to feel the same way that I feel. Like, uh, also, I'm a CO2 scientist. I work with fuels. I work on the technology to bring CO2 out of the fuel before it gets burned. We have that technology. And nobody is saying that developing countries have to go through burning fossil fuels in order to develop further. They can skip what we had to go through. They can go straight to nuclear energy and renewable energy. Like, we can do that. We absolutely can. And the problem of money will always be a problem. Absolutely. But the only thing that can save this 1.5 degree is radical change. And none of what the two panels were saying inspires any radical change, and it's the only thing that's going to work. Can I just ask you a follow-up, please? Because you've made a very interesting and, and, uh, and passionate case. Can I ask you a follow-up question? You, I think you mentioned about generations. Do you see this in a generational perspective? Do you think that different generations have a different take on this and that your generation has a different take? Um, Generally speaking, I would say that the older generation agrees with the toxicity of burning fossil fuels, but are less inclined to want to do that big radical change, that radical step. And the older generation is kind of like, go forth, younger millennials, etc., cetera, and, and do the work that we couldn't do. It's, it's kind of a little bit more complacent, but all in all agreeing. OK, you very know. interesting. Thank you. I think it's a misconception to compare oil to sugar. First of all, nobody is banning sugar, you know? And uh, that's one, ex one thing I'd say. The other thing is, I'm, I am equally disappointed to the fact that everybody blankly agrees that CO2, man-made CO2, is really drastically increasing the warming of the planet. There are not hundreds, thousands of scientists dispute that, the fact that humans are actually human-made global warming is existing is one. The second is that even if we do, Matt Ridley is, Ridley is one of them. I have to calm down. Matt Ridley is one of them. He says, yeah, we might be, but it is nominal. And it's not bad for the planet, it's good for the planet. So these are the first two things I'd like to say. The other thing I'd like to say, I am a skeptic of man-made global warming. And do you know what made me a skeptic? 2005, I read an article in The Independent out of all newspapers, interviewing people, including David Bellamy, who was talking about the water vapor rather than the CO2. So these people are wiped out. There are MIT professors who don't agree with the panel, saying that it is actually warming. Because you're scared to say 
it's not actually made by, one by the humans. Actually, it has become a religion. So I was scared to talk out. I really have. Was. Okay. Just, so that's Thank what, you. So also, Real quick. Uh, one, one more. The fact that all Western leaders 100% agree with this doesn't make you suspicious. Okay, thank you very much. And then over here to that lady there. All right, thank you so much and thanks for this interesting discussion. I just want to raise a point about how, um, like you mentioned, there are scientists that talk about how climate change is not man-made or is, is the, the impact of humans on climate change is nominal. But we also have a whole governmental body called IPCC, which is a body full of scientists that are irregularly publishing uh, reports and research on climate change and how it impacts and how our human activities impact the world. These are really open source uh, resources that you could check out. But also, I come from a country where we don't even have the privilege right now to read about climate change science because we can see it in our life. I, in my country last year, there were floods that impacted over two million people in just a span of three weeks. We're talking about millions of families that lost their houses in over a night just because of floods. And these are directly linked to climate change. So when we talk about climate change, we need to also discuss equity and justice. It's not everyone, mm -hmm. not, not all of us are in a privileged, um, privileged position to actually think about fossil fuels and how we need to extract more of them because of development. We know from the IPCC reports and the Union of C that in order for us to reach a 1.5 degree or even the two, we need to stop emitting. But what we need to ask, ask ourselves right now is who should stop? Because some countries like the UK have enough infrastructure to actually shift away from fossil fuels in a matter that would not impact their economic development while leaving a room for other developing countries to use that as a way to actually build an infrastructure so that the next time floods can come in my country, two million families will not be impacted again. So we need to think about justice when we talk about climate change. Thank you very much. Right, so back to our panel. And that last question on whether who should, or, or the question of who should stop is, I think, a really key question. So I'd love you to answer that as well. No, and I appreciate those comments. And I thought all the critical comments were thoughtful. And so I want to stress the way that I think about it, which is my priority is not that we destroy our standard of living and hope that that means fewer floods in a, in a place like where you, you're from. My uh, goal is that every country, including where you're from, has the infrastructure in order to protect themselves from flooding. Mm -hmm. And that was the whole point about our ability to master climate, is yeah. that what we should be doubling down on is having everybody able to do what the US and the UK have done, which is protect us from an inherently uh, threatening climate, and the best way is with the best energy. Now, you raised the point of like, well, we have these alternatives, and part of what I'd argue um, is that the alternatives aren't where we need them to be, but we could debate that, but what, we could, what I hope we can agree on is that what we should want is we should want for, if you're concerned with CO2, you should be pushing for um, non-CO2 forms of energy that are able to outcompete uh, CO2 forms of energy. And if that happens, that's amazing. But what we don't want to do if we care about human beings is make their energy more expensive because then that wipes out our ability to deal with any climate challenge. So that's kind of how I think about those issues. Thank you, Thank you Don. Casper. Uh, um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I couldn't agree more. And I, I actually think that, you know, the points that were made about development and, and developing countries, I mean, I'm really passionate about development. That's, that's part of my whole point, really. In fact, you know, if I, if I actually thought that we would do it, I would be really pushing for, you know, the, the richest countries to be massively investing in nuclear power in, in developing countries, but they're not going to do that, you know. I mean, we, we argued this stuff over 20 years ago, but they won't, won't even build nuclear power plants here, which is what we should have been doing then. You know, it's all very well to sort of bang on as if uh, about fossil fuels, but there's been a lack of investment in, in that, that really <laughs> essential alternative, especially for electricity generation. Um, so, so that was one thing. I also thought, I mean, the points about adaptation are really important because this is exactly it. Having a good level of development um, enables you to adapt. You know, we, people will be able to live good lives in a different climate if they have the right level of development. 
while we have the, the sort of the uneven level of development that we have in the world today, that's not going to be possible. That's what the problem is. That's a social problem. This has got nothing to do with CO2 or oil or anything. This is a social problem that our societies have been unable to develop 90% of the population to have a decent standard of living. And I, yeah, okay. Great. Thank I've you. I've got other points, but I'll yep. stop. <laughs> Sorry. Right, we're going to whiz along the front, get as many people as possible. Every comment from the floor has maybe changed my mind about what I was going to say. Um, <laughs> I'm, but I, I think, first of all, I think the woman over, the young woman over there, it's really sad, really disappointing that young people are living such fearful lives when everything is, in the, is, so, is getting so good and so positive. I'm getting to the point of absolute frustration with eco-warriors who, who, who think that fossil fuels are changing the world for the worse when they're quite positive, you know, it's absolutely clear and I could give you multiple examples how it's making it a better place but there seems to be an absolute willful misunderstanding about how easy it is to come off fossil fuels it is impossible as this gentleman here has pointed out Everything in this room depends on fossil fuels. Everything. Our entire life, I'm wearing single-use plastic, and we all are. But there's a, it's, almost, it's almost willful, the misunderstanding. People say, leave it in the ground. Right? What are we going to make roads out of? The interconnectedness of modern life is astounding. What are you going to do? You're going to, you're going to take the bitumen from the oil uh, to, to make roads and throw the diesel fuel into the sea. You, you, it, oil comes in fractions, right? It, the interconnect. But uh, I, I, I did. A, can I really just you make this point? Really right. Really okay. <laughs> I did a petition for the Cumbria coal mine that Casper was. It got a thousand signatures. A petition appeared on my page for a hundred thousand pigs who were going to be slaughtered. Right. That has got tens of thousands of people signing because they care about these pigs. These pigs are going to be slaughtered and thrown into landfill because there's a shortage of CO2 to slaughter them properly in abattoirs. <laughs> yeah. Why is there a shortage of CO2? There's a shortage of CO2 because there's the price, the, not a shortage, but the rise in price of methane. Methane is made to make um, stuff you put, fertilizers. It's used to make fertilizers. CO2 is a byproduct of it. The complexity of the fossil fuel industry and its interconnected with us with modern life is astounding. Okay, thank you very much. And we're going to whiz along the front. Yeah, I just wanted to say that to both of you, um, we face a climate disaster in this country every single year. It's called winter. <laughs> and we don't... Oh, we, we don't see it as a climate disaster because we've got fossil fuels and because we've, we've been able to develop to cope with winter. And the answer to the problems that you're facing is development, and that development will probably have to be powered with fossil fuels. It's not by getting rid of fossil fuels. Thank you very much. And then quickly here. Thank you. Uh, thank you for mentioning the... Um, uh, to look at the cost and benefits of uh, fossil fuels, but I'm observing that most of the costs are typically understood to be, uh, the cost will be negative, and then all the benefits of fossil fuels are not environmental. Uh, do you think that this uh, dichotomy is fueling the divisiveness of the debate? Thank you very much. Right, with regard to the guy from Bangladesh, who's, um, I, you know, I've no doubt that there is, are issues with his community sinking, but I should imagine that's, that is a geological problem. Um, you know, 30 years ago, we were told the Maldives were going to be gone by now, but actually they're bigger than they were 30 years ago because, you know, the ground shifts. Um, sea level is not actually rising except by maybe a couple of millimetres a year, which is not going to cause anybody any real issues. Um, and as regards to flooding, yeah, we, we all know that flooding has always happened and there's been no increase in the, the rate or the amount of flooding over the last 100 years, as if you look, actually look at the data. Um, and you mentioned the IPCC. Um, being a body of, of, you know, supposedly sort of scientists who are totally um, independent and, and so on. But the IPCC is a political organisation that was set up to actually promote the idea that CO2 is a problem. And if you look at the people who work for the IPCC, they are, they are certainly not the, le the world's leading scientists. That is, is completely untrue. Okay, thanks very much. Yeah, so there's kind of a couple of points I want to make. Um, I've, I've noticed that there does seem to be a divide, actually, that we've raised in the... Uh, 
we mentioned about generational divide earlier, um, and there definitely does seem to be an observation that younger people seem to be more in support of uh, climate change and climate change efforts, and older people aren't. So I wonder if maybe we could actually try and have a look at this divide that does seem to be here and wonder perhaps why that is. And I think there's maybe some way I can look at this. Is um, So one of my points is I think we've talked a lot about um, fossil fuels now, um, but we haven't to talk that much about the future. And I think we're using um, our standards now, the standards of the present, to um, almost extrapolate outwards and say, well, therefore, things can't be different in the future and things shouldn't be different in the future. So we're almost we're judging our values of what we think the sh future should be based on what we currently have in terms of how many fossil fuels we use um, and that sort of thing. Um, okay, real quick. And then the other point is um, there's some uncertainty regarding impact here. Um, I feel that perhaps when we look at the uncertainty of the negative effect of fossil fuels, it seems curious to me that we then suggest that, say, the risks of um, going from renewables are somehow worse. I think we need to look at what the risks are and the worst risks and, and then the best risks and then try and work out, okay, what is it that we think is um, acceptable and what do we think actually this is not an outcome we want, even if there is a small sort of possibility of it occurring. Okay, um, thanks very much. Thank you. Um, so a couple of points. One is that there seems to be a sort of entitlement to a living standard which only a very small handful globally can afford to sustain. And it's at the expense of a global majority that we're willing to continue with our sort of blindly fishing for any solution that could be possible. And I would suggest that perhaps when we start thinking about at whose expense are we willing to carry on burning fossil fuels, you suggest that you know, here in the developed world, as we call it, we, can, we have the capacity to cope with climate impacts. We've seen flooding in London. How did we cope with it there? We've seen flooding up north. We haven't coped with it there, and we have the alleged resources and all the fossil fuels we can burn in the UK. And it hasn't stopped people dying from air pollution here or in China, where development has increased, but at what cost to those people as well? You have one minute each. <laughs> Don. Well, I'll just reiterate that like, my whole goal is, is precisely for everybody on this planet to be able to share in the progress and prosperity that we've had, which I don't think has come at the expense of the unempowered world. I think that the whole globe can become empowered as long as we use the best forms of energy in societies that leave us free to solve the problems that are inevitable. I mean, the fact is that it's not like we created a dangerous climate. It's that there's always been a dangerous climate that thankfully more and more of humanity can master. Hmm. But one kind of practical tip since, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that was raised here is uh, there's a site that I've had a little bit to do with building called energytalkingpoints.com which just, it gives some of the facts th from nonpartisan sources that I use to inform my thinking and kind of the framework uh, that I find most appealing for energy. So if it is something you're interested in, that's one place to go um, to get a kind of different opinion than what we conventionally hear. Thank you, Don. Casper. Okay, um, just to clarify a couple of things quickly, um, I'm all for renewables. It's just that they won't do all of the things that we need. I'm all for nuclear power. That's mainly going to be good for electricity generation. It also won't do all the things we need. So just to pick up on those things. Batteries on the innovation front, I mean, maybe we'll get there. That would be great if we, if we do. Who, who knows? Maybe, you know, 50 years down the line, we'll have batteries that can fly a plane. Brilliant. Um, the, the, the woman over here said no one's saying we shouldn't dig it up. That's absolutely wrong. They are saying we shouldn't dig it up, and they're stopping us digging it up. So, so that, that I just wanted to pick up on that. Um, I, th I think also, you know, just thinking about change, I mean, the young people talk about, uh, I can't remember who it was, said something about radical change. I want to see radical change. I actually want a better future. I want people in, in you know, everyone in the world to, to have a, a better life than they have today. Not sustain the present, not interested in that at all. I want, I want a better okay, future. The geoengineering, I did want to just say this, you know, we're talking about the, the divide, um, the supposed divide uh, between different generations, which I don't, don't believe exists at all. Um, I actually think, all right, who of that younger generation, I didn't have time to ask the question, but who of that younger generation are in favour of doing something about it via things like geoengineering? Okay, right. So, thank you very much to the audience and to our speakers. <laughs>